Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. From God, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from St. John's Revelation, chapter 12, the first six verses. Utter appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. He gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So far, I text. Dear Christian friends, it is December 20th. By now, I think we've received maybe 20 Christmas cards. Just kind of come pouring in. Turn on the power. There we go. That's kind of one example of what you might see in a Christmas card. Maybe it's a person's family. That's fine. And yet, this is kind of the romanticized picture of Christmas, the, the nativity scene. And I think all of my daughters, maybe some of my sons, tried to take a little baby and wrap it up and they found something to put the baby in because that's what happens at Christmas time. It's kind of a cute little picture of what happened. And yet when you look at this, it's a little ridiculous, isn't it? Ladies, is there a place that smells worse than a barn? Is there a worse place possible to have a child? After you have the child and you need to put it down, would you put it in the bowl where the cow is going to come? Did Mary have to shoo away the cow that came to lick her son? That's not a happy thought. And yet this is what we do with Christmas. We try to make it almost better than what it is. It couldn't get more humble if God tried. Where, where else would you go? This is this, It's shelter, technically. If it was raining, I guess they would have had a couple drops. But, yeah, this is pretty bad. Well, the text before you today is very similar. That's a Christmas card, and so is this. If you use these words and try to paint a picture in your head, and I'm going to help you a little bit, of course, but if you use... These words to paint the picture in your head. You see God's Christmas card. The woman, a dragon, and a child. Let's look at this first verse. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars under uh, on her head. It's an interesting picture. Some people have get well, if you had to guess who the woman is, we're talking about Christmas. Probably going to be Mary. Our church body just finished putting out a new evangelism video. My son, my savior, we're going to be using it as the basis for our Bible studies going forward for the next couple months, probably. It's a 40 minute long movie. And I'll send out a link. Very well done. Awesome. It tells the story of sin and grace, Jesus saving the world wonderfully. And that's, this is the woman who plays Mary throughout the whole movie. And so if you had to guess, looking at this, if somebody said, who is the woman going to be? You'd say Mary. And yet very often, as you go through the Bible, a great practice is if you come across something and you're not sure what it is, keep reading. We call this letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Because oftentimes, if there's something that God's talking about, he explains it in very simple terms if you just keep on going. Sometimes it's somewhere else in the Bible, but in this case in Revelation, our God tells us exactly who it is in verse 17, just a little bit after our text. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who, who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
Now, if you want to figure out who are those who obey God's commandment and hold to the testimony of Jesus, that would be Christians. Yeah. Old Testament Christians and New Testament Christians. Because you've probably heard me say that the Jews weren't any different than you. They waited for a Savior who would come and worship him. You celebrate the fact that he did come. It's not a whole lot different. Well, this is who the woman is, and yet the image might not be one that's extremely familiar to you. I don't have a picture. It's very hard to duplicate this. Anytime you see someone clothed with the sun, this doesn't show up well in a picture. It kind of gets whited out. But, Scripture does describe us this way. As we're wearing our robe of righteousness that we got at our baptism, we are clean and white before our God. The twelve stars in this crown on her head, well, this is the crown of victory. There's a couple different words for crowns in the Greek, and we're going to get to the next one when we get to the dragon. But this first one is about a crown of victory. And the twelve stars in her head, well, twelve is the number of the church. Revelation is a very symbolic book. There were twelve tribes of Israel. There were twelve apostles. And so the number for the church has always been twelve. This is just another confirmation. This is all Christians from all time represented in this woman and her offspring. Well, this is how you look by faith. This is maybe not how you look when you look at the world around you and when you look at churches around you. Yet this is still how God sees you. You're beautiful to him. Worth than all. God loves you. And he's washed you clean by the blood of his son. Let's keep going. She was, this is verse 2. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. This is a fantastic picture. There are no good pictures of seven-headed dragons. They just don't exist. And so that's the best one I could find of a red one. How's that? It's a, it's a dragon. And uh, you only get one guess this time as to who the dragon might be. This is the devil, yeah. Satan, the accuser. He's got a few different names. And in Revelation, he is the dragon. And it's not a pretty picture. This is awful for Christmas. And But uh, before we go too far, and you just take my word that it's actually Satan, Let's jump down to verse 9 when God confirms it again. If we let Scripture interpret Scripture, the great dragon, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. There you go. Okay. Now, what's he doing? He's waiting to devour. Well, first let's, let's, let's describe what he looks like. He's got seven heads. If there's anything that, that you have to think about Satan, he's a wannabe. He wants to be like God, and he's got seven heads, and he's got seven crowns. Yet this is not the victor's crown. This is a diadem. This is a crown of a king or authority. Now, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? Except that when you look at this little girl, is she wearing a crown? Does she have any authority to rule just because she's wearing a crown? No. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't want to land of the poor girl, but she doesn't really have any power at all. Now, Satan has a little bit of power. He gets to sweep a third of the stars out of the sky. This is verse 4. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. He is plenty powerful. We sing in the famous Reformation hymn, on earth is not his equal. You don't stand a chance against him all by yourself. And yet you're not alone, of course. Satan does not go up against you alone. He goes up against you and God and Jesus. But let's stick with this card that God is playing out for us and exactly what happened. Listen to the second half of verse 4. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. That is a gruesome, horrible picture, of course, and yet you have to understand how this almost happened. Jesus' birth was a daring move by God to send his son into the world. Risky business, you have to understand. If Jesus had 
sin, if he had missed up just one little time, everything would have been lost. We glaze over these details, and yet all of this hung in a balance his whole life, and especially when he was born. King Herod killed all babies two years and under in Bethlehem. The slaughter of the innocents is what we call it. He's not the first evil ruler to walk the face of the earth. Yet he did almost get Jesus. This didn't work, of course. The flight to Egypt meant that the Son of God escaped that horrible slaughter. And yet it almost happened. I think that that alone can give us a picture that might be a little confusing because verse 5 is almost a jump in logic. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. This still isn't a picture that people have very easily, and yet this is one all over the pages of Scripture. Psalm 2 says that the one enthroned in heaven laughs. And later in verse 6 in Psalm 2, you will rule them with an iron scepter. This is all over. If a Jew would have read this verse in Revelation, they'd say, of course that's Jesus. That's what he does. And yet we miss that picture because we see him before Pontius Pilate when he says, my kingdom is not of this world. We don't see that. And yet all Christians from all time have known that one day Jesus will come to end the world. In Philippians we say, every knee will bow before our God. That will happen on the last day, and yet for now, we don't see it that much. Terrorists get to make their own nation in the Middle East. It's terrifying to think what's happening. Yet our God is still in control. Jesus is still the one who rules the world. Well, we keep going. And her child was snatched up to God and, and to his throne. This, of course, points to the ascension. Jesus did not stick around. After his work was done for saving the world, he ascended into heaven. He got out of the way of the Holy Spirit so that the gospel could go out. His hearts could be changed. Now before we go in and apply this to our own lives, there are two things I need to hit on. First I want to take you to Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's Pentecost sermon. Then Peter stood up, addressed the crowd, and said, This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, with that, he ushered in the end times. Everything had been accomplished that needed to. And the world could end at any moment. And that was some 2,000 years ago. So we wait. And so, look at this last verse in, the, in keeping those words in mind. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. This is where people's eyes glaze over and they're like, what is God talking about in Revelation? It's not as tricky as what you might think. If you break that down, first of all, know that you have a place to live. The problem is it's the desert. So God's church hasn't always been glamorous. You don't think of it, we're not in Disney World, okay? But we're safe. It was prepared by God, so he has a plan for you. And that's very important to remember when your life spirals out of control. But that's not where we're going to be forever. God will take us home one day. Now, to the 1260. 1260 days breaks down into 42 months or three and a half years. The number seven is a very complete number used all over the Bible. God uses it. How many days are in a week? Seven. None of this is accidental, of course. This is how my God works. Well, what? Half of seven? Three and a half years. So if the first half of the world was up until Jesus was born, three and a half years, and the second half of the world is three and a half years, this is what my God says, that we'll be kept safe for three and a half years. When those three and a half years are up, we get to go home. Now this is important for a couple of reasons. 
You're going to see Mary in the Bible class look out the window and say, how long is it going to be until he comes? They didn't know. From the time of Moses and the Passover, it was 1,500 years. You don't know exactly how old the world was. Yet it, that people had to wait a long time for Jesus to come. And so people look at us now and they say, well, how long is that second half of that three and a half years? It's not necessarily a mirror image. That's not how God renders time anywhere in the Bible. And yet know that he will come. And it's not hopeless. You can look out your window and you can look up. And the reason we have blue for a color in Advent because it's the color of the sky. That's just because it's pretty. Because that's where you're going to be looking when Jesus comes back to rule the nations with an iron scepter and to rescue his, his bride, the church, as she's described throughout the Bible. Because you'll be saved. Dear friends, you don't always have a whole lot of control of your life. And I pray that you're beginning to ease into your holiday week and you're able to relax. You're able to carve out time to have devotion with your God and worship with Him, with His Word and any of the resources that we offer here. Take advantage of those. Remember what God's Christmas card looked like. It's not necessarily a nativity scene. It's a woman, a dragon, and a child. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.